At Kelly Companies, it is no secret that they believe in the power of people. In an effort to help their Keelians get to know each other a little bit better, they decided to launch the Who Do You Know campaign. The goal was simple. Keelians were encouraged to have a conversation with someone outside of their circle. That's it. These conversations, however, have brought people together and farthered their world-class culture. Shout out to the Keelians who have made an effort to have meaningful conversations with new friends. You can learn more about those conversations, about those amazing friends, by visiting them online at KeelyCompanies.com. Welcome to the Live Inspired Podcast with John O'Leary. John is the number one national best-selling author of the book On Fire. He's a world-class inspirational speaker, and he's the host of the Live Inspired Podcast. John interviews extraordinary individuals on their life story so that you can wake up from accidental living and more fully live your life story. Here's your host, John O'Leary. Well, hello, my friends, and welcome to the Live Inspired Podcast with John O'Leary. I've asked my podcast producer, her name is Amy Loyette, if we could shift the schedule a little bit and I could bring to you a very special episode today. So if you haven't yet buckled up, you will want to right now. Here we go. Here's why. For the past five weeks, we've had the absolute pleasure to work alongside of hundreds of talented directors, stunt coordinators, set designers, production assistants, boom operators, award-winning actors, makeup artists, sound folks, best boys, and many, many, many more key roles in making a feature-length film. A few episodes ago, I shared the story of how seven years ago, the On Fire movie started as a dream. After hearing my speech delivered, a woman named Linda Huntington, she's on set today as well, asked if we would consider turning that speech, that story, that book into a movie. Many months had passed before a screenwriter named Gregory Poirier developed a script that repeatedly moved me to tears as I read through it. It was many more months that a director, his name is Sean McNamara, he's also on set today, signed to be part of that film. And suddenly, we were assigning actors, securing filming locations, and raising additional funds to make this dream a reality. Well, my friends, today, as I sit in the director's chair with the words on fire behind them and John O'Leary in front of them, we're just a couple days away from calling out the words... It's a wrap. And I wanted to reflect on some of the most amazing experiences we've had, some of the leaders who have shown up alongside of us to be part of it and the community that is helping us bring this thing to life. So my friends, I promise you that I'd bring you alongside for the ride. And today you will have a front row seat into the filming, the production, the creation of the movie On Fire. So buckle up as I bring on my producer. Her name is Amy Loyette to ask some questions of me coming in from the community. John, our Live Inspired community jumped at the opportunity to get a behind the scenes look at the making of the On Fire movie. We posted a few photos to social media earlier this week, as you know, and everyone is very, very excited to learn more. So let's dive right in. Ann Orzo asks, don't you just pinch yourself sometimes? Amy, awesome question. And by the way, just so the folks know at home, my, my brother, Jameson, who is the sound engineer for this entire film, is stepping away from his work for just a moment to help us do exactly this. Every microphone right now is being worn by folks like William H. Macy, Stephanie Shostak, John Corbett, among many, many others. So we have one microphone. Our audience should know this, Amy. One microphone that, that Jameson is going back and forth between our producer and her understudy, John O'Leary. So it's pretty hilarious as you lean in, ask the question, and then bail out again. So if they hear some laughter or some heavy breathing, that's what's going on right now. I haven't been this close to Amy since she hired on four years ago, but I'm glad you're here. And Ann Orso, I'm glad you asked the question. So do I sometimes pinch myself? Uh, no, not sometimes, all the time. This whole experience in life has been surreal to me. This idea of surviving and having all these people championing this survival story has been surreal to me. The folks who've shown up alongside of us, the friends who came alongside of us, the family that, that guided it forward, and for ultimately this to lead to a full feature film here in St. Louis with some true stars bringing this thing to life. It's unreal. So uh, I don't sometimes pinch myself, and I constantly pinch myself, and this time I hope I don't wake up because it's, uh, it's been a wild, awesome ride. 
And John, I can say, even from all of us folks on your team, it has been a wild and awesome ride for us. Abby Richter and Lori Metcalf both asked, what has surprised you most about the filmmaking process? Abby and Lori, the, the first thing was how miserably slow this thing is. It's like, what are these people doing? It takes forever to get a scene shot. And the first day I remember Sean put his arm around me and he says, can you believe I get paid to do this? I have the best job in the world. And I thought to myself, I don't know, man. I'm not sure this is the best job in the world. Now that I've been alongside of Sean and this amazing team, it is the best job in the world to slowly create art. And if you're gonna create something worthy, it takes a while to do exactly that. So watching these guys work as an army to make the people on screen look brilliant and sound beautiful, that's been probably the most surprising thing. And now surprised by that is how much I enjoy it. So uh, I'm not sure if this is my last film or the first of hundreds, but I can tell you Sean's right. Can you believe I get the honor and the joy of being paid to do this? No, what, what, a, what a gift, man. So Sean's lucky and so am I. That's awesome. Our friend Diane Redman asks, so often when you read one's book and then you see the movie, you have to wonder if the movie was really based on the book or if maybe just a suggestion. How closely does the movie On Fire follow your book and your life story? Or has there been quite a bit of poetic license used? Well, hello, Diane Redman. It's good to hear some names that I, I know and love from our online community. Diane's certainly one of them. So the book was taken directly from the book On Fire, and in all, that's where this film grew out of. The screenwriter is a guy who's become a friend named Gregory Poirier. And Gregory and I sat side by side as we worked through not only the creation of the script, but the editing process of the script. So is it like the book? Uh, no, it is exactly the book for the most part. Amy, you've been alongside of me for much of this process. And today we're on set filming Jack Buck and John O'Leary at the stadium and it's real. And now we're actually not even at the stadium filming the scene. We, we borrowed some space near the stadium, but when they see it on the film, they'll be sure that they were next to John at Bush Stadium two in 1987. And the conversation that is being had between William H. Macy and little James McCracken is the exact conversation had between Jack Buck and John O'Leary 36 years ago. So uh, most films, it begins with the words, based on a true story. And then you see the word Batman or a super, and it's like, dude, that's not based on a true story. This one is based on a true story. And uh, we're grateful that not only are they bringing this true story to life, but the details to them matter. And I think for those who uh, know our story well, when they see this film, they'll realize, wow, not only are the words true and the scenes true, but the background art is true. So yeah, they're getting all the details just right. Shannon G asks, how have you and your family been feeling about filming and reliving all the experiences throughout your life? For me, the toughest, most emotional day was, was the day they filmed at my parents' house when they shot the scene of the little boy on fire. They shot the scene of Stella, who plays Amy O'Leary, and all she did in the front yard, and a kid named Mikey, who played my brother Jim, all they did for John O'Leary, the trauma and the drama in their faces, the agony in their tears, and how real it felt. Like, that, that was hard. And then after lunch, you know, cut! We go, we go to lunch, we come back, and then uh, we film The Homecoming. And one of the most moving things that's taken place on set was one of the background talent was a guy named Jim O'Leary. Jim is in his early 50s. Jim's an attorney here in St. Louis, and Jim is my older brother. Uh, when little John comes out of the car, it's a 1985 station wagon Mercury. When little boy actor comes out of the car, I look over to the right, and I see the real Jim O'Leary in his early 50s crying. I get emotional even saying it. And I'm like, ah, you know, he, everyone gets sad occasionally, but then they cut. Then the, the station wagon pulls up again. The little boy gets out of the car. I look at my brother, and he's crying again. I'm like, dang it, Jim. So I start crying, and it happened like 11 times. This, it's a big scene. Folks will see it in the theaters. To see my brother's emotion time after time after time as they portray a thing that actually happened, as he shakes the hand of the boy playing him, knowing that my brother Jim saved my life, and the character who played my brother Jim did the exact same actions fought the fire, beat it down with the rug, and uh, in doing so, burned himself and saved his brother. So these, say, these moments of grace have been captured, and to see how my siblings have been moved by this, <laughs> in addition to that moment, that little girl had just walked through, you guys, like we're on a live set right now. Her name is Stella. Stella's this beautiful little blonde who plays my sister Amy, 
Amy flew in town from Austin to see the set and see her actor playing her. And the moment that those two met, man, both of them broke into tears. So like we're, we're doing something meaningful here. And uh, I'm just glad that it's being captured and it's moving not only audiences, it's moving my siblings. Dan wants to know, are there any particular stories or moments, et cetera, from the crew members, not so much the cast members, but the crew members that stand out to you? So we're recording this on a microphone by, held by Jameson. Jameson is not only a professional, he's my friend now. Jameson served as a Marine. Jameson is a hero. And on November 10th, we celebrated the Marine's birthday. And one of the coolest things that happened on set was when Jameson brought out this cake to celebrate the anniversary. 240, 248 years, Jameson tells me, of the Marines serving our nation. And to see one of the finest servants of the Corps bring out this cake, make it an announcement. Hundreds of extras were part of that day because we were filming at St. Louis University. And the way this entire room silenced themselves in the presence of greatness. And then the way they, they celebrated the Marine song. And then the way they cut this cake with the Marine sword. Am I saying that word right? Inseal sword. sword. And the process that these men went through of serving, the, and ladies, of serving the cake. It started with the youngest serving the oldest. Yes. <clears throat> the youngest ser serving the oldest. And then around the table for all the veterans who'd served our nation, serving one another. And that's enough to drop the mic. We should end the podcast with that. But then Jameson calls me back up and says, we have one more we got to serve. And he cuts one more piece of cake. And I'm looking at the man who gave it to me. But, uh, dude, it's an emotional moment when Jameson cuts this piece, brings me back up, and feeds me as if I'm worthy of being uh, <clears throat> celebrated with these great servants. So uh, every time – you can't talk today, man. You don't have a mic. Every time I see this sound engineer, this sound leader – I get emotional because I see, and I won't tell you all today what Jameson did in the Corps, but I told my friends last night, I spoke to about 45 Marines in St. Louis, and I talked about Jameson specifically and his service and how that service changed his life too. So, man, I, I walk in sacred ground on this set, and part of what makes it sacred is guys like Jameson who served our nation. It's one of my favorite moments from the entire filming. That's incredible, and we're thrilled to have Jameson on set, especially to bring you this podcast today. As John mentioned, we are on a live set. There was quite a few complications, but I'm glad we could pull it all together. We have both Patty and Shannon are curious to know how much interest and participation have your four children had in the On Fire movie? You know, it's funny. The, my kids are so unimpressed by their dad, which I love. Like, they don't care that I speak. They don't care that I do podcasting. They don't care that I have books. They don't care when people come out in the community and, and they're like, oh, I read your book or I heard you speak. And, Can I hug you? And that, is, that does not impress them. They are underwhelmed by their dad until, until Hollywood comes knocking. All of a sudden, they still don't like their dad. Like, they're not impressed by their father, but they're impressed by this process. So when filming, you're only allowed to be in front of a camera once. You know, because you can't be in scene after scene. It kind of looks goofy if uh, Jack O'Leary is in 11 scenes over 32 years. But they were in one scene. Go to the movie and you'll find them somewhere. I promise you find Waldo. And one of the other cool things that has happened is they keep asking, can I come on site? Can I come on site? And the answer is always yes. Uh, and one day Jack said, can I, come, can I come on site? Absolutely. And then he texted back, can I bring a friend? I'm like, Absolutely. Uh, about 15 minutes later, three carloads of DeSmet boys get out of their cars, man. I'm like, Jack, you know, you, can I bring a friend, man? We're filming at Grandma and Grandpa's house. But all of them came on, and then something cool happened. McNamara took a break for a moment, Sean, the director. He shook all of their hands, and all of them wanted selfies with Sean McNamara. And this guy's, you know, this is a $10 million film. Like, there's a lot going on. There's a lot of people he's paying. He's got a lot of responsibilities. He took time to take a picture with each of those boys and talk about what it was like to shoot Soul Surfer and Miracle Season and the other things that he's done that impressed them. So what impressed me about that was not that Jack and his boys wanted to come on set, but that this busy Hollywood producer is humble enough to say, yeah, let me show you boys around. Everyone does seem like family around here. Beth wants to know um, what the cast thinks about their characters and your story and why they wanted these roles and how they prepared for those roles. Awesome. So why don't we start with Jack Buck? Probably one of the better known actors in our movie is William H. Macy. So William H. Macy spent a ton of time listening to broadcast of Jack Buck. So he wanted to get the voice and the cadence down to the degree that he could. 
Uh, he also uh, wanted to get the face of Jack Buck down, and I'm not going to talk much about that today, but let's just say when you see William H. Macy, you are seeing Jack Buck. And I'm not the only one saying that. Anyone who knew Jack Buck, when they see Bill Macy, sees Jack Buck. It is unbelievable. Uh, so he spent a lot of time there. He also wanted to spend time with, with Jack's kid, Joe Buck. So Joe and Bill had several conversations understanding how Jack walked how he walked into a room, how the room changed when he walked in, why his dad did what he did, why he visited not only a kid in the hospital bed, but veterans in retirement homes, why he went to senior citizen houses, why he went to prisons around the state, why he bought lunches for everybody every time he was out having his own lunch. This was a man who gave, but knowing that's not enough, Bill wanted to find out from Joe why, because that's gonna inform the way he walks into a hospital room on the first day he finds out and why he comes back even when he's told that the little boy's gonna die. So that's pretty cool to know the care that Bill went through to play the part of Jack Buck, which is awesome. What I'll say without boring our entire audience back to sleep is every character went through that same process. Stephanie Shostak, my mom, sat with my mom, had meals with my mom, talked with my mom on the phone, their first meeting I captured on a photograph. You can look at johnolearyinspires.com forward slash podcast. We'll have a picture of that right up there. And you'll see two women who are crying as they greet one another for the first time. These are fast friends who love each other. They just hadn't yet met. And so when they did meet, it was pretty clear that uh, it was a special moment. We captured that. Stephanie has been a brilliant version of this fierce woman named Susan O'Leary. My, the boys who are playing John, Jill Courtney, uh, you may not know the name, but your daughter does. This, this man is beloved in schools because he's played several characters, whether it's a kissing booth or Jesus Revolution or many, many others. Super 8 is a huge movie that Joel was in. He's an awesome actor. But I like him even more than his acting because of his heart. He's a man who is lit up with joy. He loves his bride. He loves life. He loves God. He's kind to others. He has no ego. He's just good. And when we're trying to play the part of John O'Leary, we needed someone who could uh, <laughs> try to portray love and life and joy, even when the days are hard and long. And when you're acting, the days usually are hard and long. Joel and I spent quite a bit of time together getting ready for this. And the best way I can say this, Amy, you've said it to me, so I'll say it to our audience, people aren't worried if I die anymore around my office because they know they'll just bring in Joel. And the, the, John O'Leary will just continue on in the presence of Joel Courtney. He has become me, man, in his cadence, in his tempo, in his voice, in his hoarseness when he sometimes speaks, and the way he treats people, and the goofiness with which he laughs. So uh, Joel is amazing. And his equal on set is the kid 30 years younger than he is. Uh, a little boy named James McCracken. We had 800 people read for the role of James, ultimately little John O'Leary, and we chose James because of his heart. Because of his heart. So um, we chose the right person, and as I put a wrap on this question, we're about to take pause from this podcast for a moment because our sound engineer has work to do. We'll come back to you in a moment. But every single cast member took that same care and concern to meet with the person they were playing and strive to become that person they were playing. Okay, I have to ask, though, has there been any moments where you've been utterly starstruck by any of the cast? So I've been starstruck, not by the cast. They bore me. Corbett bores me. Shostak bores me. Macy bores me. They all bore me. But I will say when I was starstruck was the moment when a woman named Carol Buck who married a guy named Jack Buck, met a guy named Bill Macy, William H. Macy for the first time. And it wasn't Bill Macy she saw, it was her husband she saw. And if you wanna be starstruck, you watch a guy named William H. Macy who looks just like Jack Buck meeting his widow on set of a film celebrating his life, not his death. We're not afraid of death here. We, hey, watch the movie. We, we, uh, <laughs> we, we don't shy away from the dark darkness of life. but. Uh, to see those two meet for the first time was stunning. A, a separate scene, but similar, to see Natalie Buck, the granddaughter of Jack. She's an actor in, in New York, come into St. Louis, play the role of a nurse, kneel down and tell a guy named Bill Macy playing Jack Buck that the little boy is gonna die. And then to watch Jack Buck break down in the presence of his granddaughter. So I'm not starstruck by people, pe pe you know, 
they, they shower the same way you and I do. They put on their pants the same way they do. I've, ne I've never been impressed by people who are impressed by themselves. But this whole cast, this whole crew is underwhelmed by themselves, and I'm highly impressed by that. Ellie asks, which scene were you most excited to see on camera, and what has been your favorite moment on set? So th there was a moment we filled last Saturday where a nine-year-old boy named James McCracken playing John O'Leary, he looks mummified because he's wrapped from head to toes, wakes up from a, a, about his 11th surgery. And as he slowly comes to, he looks down to the end of the bed and he sees his mom and dad, played by Stephanie Shostak and John Corbett, both crying. And the little boy sweetly says, what's wrong? Why are you both crying? Because that's something his parents never did, not in front of him. And mom starts to answer the question by saying, uh, John, the surgery was successful, but, and she just can't get it out. And it's such a motherly, motherly moment where she loves him so much, she can't, she can't break his heart. So this man steps in, and I'm not trying to be chauvinistic here, but it's good to celebrate masculinity. Not the kind they so often celebrate in Hollywood, but, but care and concern and humanity and faithfulness and, and love of family and love of God and love of country. And you see all that in my dad and in others on set. And my sweet dad steps in and just says, John, listen, buddy, the surgery was a success, but they had to take your fingers. They had to amputate your fingers. And it goes on from there. But as dad is explaining, little James looks up at his bandaged hands. They look just like they looked before they took him for surgery because they're still wrapped. Nothing changed. But James recognizes his whole life changed. And to see that happen on set was the most moving thing that I saw and most of our other cast and crew saw it too. James did an incredible job. And so uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave various other scenes for people to see in the theaters, but that was a, a part that moved me to tears. My friends, we are in a new location. We just wrapped filming in the press box on at John O'Leary Day at the ballpark, and now little John is about to walk into the Cardinals locker room. So the sound may sound a little bit different, but that is life on the movie set. So, John, is there any scene that, after being filmed, surprised you? How you reacted to it surprised how you felt about seeing the scene come to life? Awesome. Yeah, so there, there's two that come to mind right away. One is the one you're referencing. This room that you're, you said John walks into, little John's going to roll into it. And to see all the Cardinals in their 1980s outfits stand up to greet him with Jack Buck in that room and my dad in the room. It's an epic, beautiful scene. And I'll give no more details than that, than that right now, but just tell me, it, let me, let me tell you, it, it's brilliant. And when you find out who the players are behind the players, you'll be even more impressed by the scene. The other scene that moved me was, uh, I, I thought the scene with Nurse Roy would be good. It turns out that it's one of the highlights of the entire movie. The gentleman playing Roy is a fellow named Devon Franklin. And I love Devon's work as a producer and, and as an actor. But why we brought him onto set again is because of his heart. This is a good and decent man. So when we brought him on, we were excited to get him. But he's taken the role of a guy who was a big part of a movie, and he's turned it into a role that is a major part of the movie. Roy is significant. And that's because not only is he in real life, but Devon has insisted he act like it in this movie. So the, the way Roy carries me forward out of a bed, the way Roy champions my recovery, the, the way Roy and I reconnect later on, and the manner in which Roy, Roy carries himself, all being presented by Devon Franklin, he's masterful. And if you haven't heard the name Devon Franklin yet, after the movie on fire, you're going to hear it a lot because I, I think he is... He's going to have a bright future in Hollywood. John, we have one final question from Mariella. She asks, what are your hopes for the movie? Well, I know a couple Mariellas, and uh, I know one who's a little bit more seasoned in life, and I know another Mariella who's a little bit uh, more of a rookie in life. So whoever I'm speaking to right now, great question, Mariella. My hope for the movie is always that we change lives. So the, the goal of our organization is to posit positively change the world one life at a time, starting with the reflection in the mirror. And what has happened on set already is lives are beginning to change. I've had almost a dozen of our crew members come up to me and talk about how their life is fundamentally different because they're part of this production, because they're part of this family now. And what I'm excited about, Amy, is that is before we cut this movie together, before we spend 12 weeks together in post-production, before we find the right partner to launch this forward into the world. And you can imagine, and at least I'm, a, I'm imagining, how many lives will be changed, not only here in the United States where we're filming, but around the world. 
It turns out that a story that is filled with hope and faith and possibility and love and family values is one that is required right now in a world that is packed with darkness and divisiveness and negativity and brokenness. So people frequently ask, hey, when's the movie coming out? Uh, I don't know exactly. I just know it's going to come out right on time and it's going to change lives for good when it does. John, that's a wrap on our questions from the Live Inspired community this time around. So thank you so much for all your incredible insight and incredible stories that I'm sure our Live Inspired community is going to love to hear. Well, Amy, thank you. And um, I'm glad you snuck away from the office. I normally don't let my employees leave. They get there at six in the morning. They leave at midnight or later, depending on how I feel. So I, I welcome you on a set. It's great having you with me. And it's been a blast having my team down here with us. So four weeks ago, starting over, a little bit more than five weeks ago, I was still learning people's names down here and what the rules were and what their job titles were. And I finally learned what a grip is. And I learned the importance of what they do. And today, as we're recording this live, I mean, they're filming quite literally as I say these words right down the hall. I just got yelled at by Greg. Leave me alone, Greg. I'm proud and in awe of more than 150 talented individuals that I'm fortunate enough to not only call part of my crew, but now my family. Looking up at one right now. So Live Inspired Community, it continues to absolutely be a magical impact on our life, bringing the on fire movie to life for your life. And we are just getting started. So for this time and until next time, my name is John O'Leary and today is your day. What a gift. Soak it up. Live inspired. One more word for you today. Action. You know that Keeley Companies is all about fostering the world-class culture through their incredible cultural pillars. Well, it was time to add a seventh cultural pillar, Keeley Green. Guided by the mission to raise the sustainability standards by which they design, build, operate, and live, Keeley Green is dedicated to using a holistic approach to leave a positive impact on our environment, create a future that is sustainable for generations to come. In the words of Rusty Keeley, we are just getting started. You can learn more about that just getting started mentality and all the work they do by visiting my friends at Keeley Companies online at keeleycompanies.com.